This is the Cambridge Assessment International Education, Cambridge IGCSE, November 2021 examination in English as a second language. Paper 4. Listening. Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the exam. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the exam. Teacher, please give out the question papers. And when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready. Here is the exam. Exercise 1. You will hear four short recordings. Answer each question on the line provided. Write no more than three words for each answer. You will hear each recording twice. Question 1. A. Who told the girl about the music website she used? B. Which instrument did the girl write about? Have you done the music homework? Yes, I used this fantastic website. What, the one the teacher gave us the link for? It was a really good site. I'm sure it was, but I lost it. Fortunately, my brother had used this other one at some point, so I had a look at that and found just what I needed. Lucky you. So, did you write about the trumpet, like you said you would? The website had information on so many different instruments that I kept changing my mind. I ended up doing my essay on the violin, but only after I'd spent ages finding out about the piano. Have you done the music homework? Yes, I used this fantastic website. What, the one the teacher gave us the link for? It was a really good site. I'm sure it was, but I lost it. Fortunately, my brother had used this other one at some point, so I had a look at that and found just what I needed. Lucky you. So, did you write about the trumpet, like you said you would? The website had information on so many different instruments that I kept changing my mind. I ended up doing my essay on the violin, but only after I'd spent ages finding out about the piano. Question 2. A. When does the boy want to get his friend's bike? B. How long does the boy want to borrow his friend's bike for? Hi Adam, it's Ahmed. I was just phoning you about your bike. It's really kind of you to offer to lend it to me, but I've just heard that the arrangements for the bike races I'm taking part in have changed. I know we'd agreed I'd pick it up on Tuesday, but would Wednesday be possible instead? Another thing is that there's going to be an extra race now on the following day, which I'd really like to take part in too, so I was wondering if it'd be possible to hold on to it for four days rather than the three days that we'd originally agreed. Anyway, ring me back. Hi Adam, it's Ahmed. I was just phoning you about your bike. It's really kind of you to offer to lend it to me, but I've just heard that the arrangements for the bike races I'm taking part in have changed. I know we'd agreed I'd pick it up on Tuesday, but would Wednesday be possible instead? Another thing is that there's going to be an extra race now on the following day, which I'd really like to take part in too, so I was wondering if it'd be possible to hold on to it for four days rather than the three days that we'd originally agreed. Anyway, ring me back. Question 3. A. Which sport has the woman just started doing? B. What did the woman enjoy least about her lesson? You look exhausted. Yes, I've just been doing some sports and I'm not used to it. I've needed to do more for ages, so instead of sitting at home watching tennis on TV, I'm actually having a go at playing it now. 
I considered taking up rugby, but that involves too much physical contact for my liking. So, have you just had a lesson? <laughs> yes. I thought it'd involve having a game with someone, but the coach had us doing lots of jumping first, which was really hard. Worse was to come, though, because after that, we went running. It seemed to go on forever. Oh, wow. You look exhausted. Yes, I've just been doing some sports and I'm not used to it. I've needed to do more for ages, so instead of sitting at home watching tennis on TV, I'm actually having a go at playing it now. I considered taking up rugby, but that involves too much physical contact for my liking. So, have you just had a lesson? <laughs> yes. I thought it'd involve having a game with someone, but the coach had us doing lots of jumping first, which was really hard. Worse was to come, though, because after that, we went running. It seemed to go on forever. Oh, wow. Question 4. A. Where will the boy go on his birthday? B. What present does the boy think he will receive? It's your birthday soon, isn't it? Yes, next week. Are you doing anything special, like you did last year? Oh yes, the fun fair. That was great. I'm sure I'll have as good a time at the transport museum, especially as my best friend's coming too. Do you know what gift you're getting? My parents always try to keep it a surprise until the actual day. My little sister told me that she saw a new laptop being delivered. I know she's just saying that to trick me though. Something tells me it might be a smartphone, which I obviously wouldn't be disappointed with. It's your birthday soon, isn't it? Yes, next week. Are you doing anything special, like you did last year? Oh yes, the fun fair. That was great. I'm sure I'll have as good a time at the transport museum, especially as my best friend's coming too. Do you know what gift you're getting? My parents always try to keep it a surprise until the actual day. My little sister told me that she saw a new laptop being delivered. I know she's just saying that to trick me though. Something tells me it might be a smartphone, which I obviously wouldn't be disappointed with. That is the end of the four short recordings. In a moment, you will hear exercise two. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 2. You will hear a woman called Maria Hallam talking about her experience of working on a shark conservation project in the Gili Islands in Indonesia. Listen to the talk and complete the details below. Write one or two words or a number in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Hi everyone. My talk today is about a fantastic shark conservation project I was involved with in the Gili Islands in Indonesia. I've always been interested in animals, particularly sea creatures. I actually worked as a vet's assistant after graduating, but was employed as a biology lecturer by the time I went to Indonesia. The university I worked for was great in letting me take a break from work to go there. Before leaving home, I decided to do a full-time diving course. Although the charity I was volunteering with said they'd provide dive training in the first two weeks of me being there, I really wanted to learn before I went. My local dive club had courses that lasted either one week or three weeks, and I chose the longer of the two to get as much experience as I could. When I arrived at the project's headquarters in the Gili Islands, it looked very much like the photos I'd seen online. What a picture could never show, though, was how good the food tasted. I was expecting it to be of the same basic quality as the accommodation there, but it was actually as good as in an expensive restaurant. 
Before we started diving, we were given information about why we need projects like the one I was on. Sharks have been part of marine ecosystems around the world for over 400 million years. Although it's estimated that there are over 900 million sharks left on Earth, we are losing roughly 100 million of these every year due to fishing. Many of the world's 440 species are caught accidentally, but the result is the same. So after learning about the damage humans are doing to these beautiful creatures, I went on my first dive. Within a few minutes, a shark appeared out of the blue. It seemed to be the exact same shape as a bull shark to me, but my dive buddy told me afterwards it was actually a tiger shark. Neither of these species is as large as a white shark that most of you have probably seen in nature documentaries on TV, but they can grow pretty big too. Each person had a specific job to do during dives, so as soon as a shark appeared, one volunteer had to photograph it, while another, in this case me, would measure it. I used a special laser device to do this. A third person would film it, but this was quite a specialized role, which I'd like to train to do one day. Back on land, there was also plenty to do. If someone had good practical skills, which I'd never claimed to have, they were often involved with improving or fixing the charity's boats. I used my IT knowledge instead to update their advertising, which really needed doing. There was time to relax at the end of each day, too. The dances, which I usually avoided, were especially popular, and the quizzes, too, although they got a little too competitive for my liking. The presentations were what I most looked forward to. They were organized by the charity and given by researchers. I hope you found that interesting. Any questions? Now you will hear the talk again. Hi everyone. My talk today is about a fantastic shark conservation project I was involved with in the Gili Islands in Indonesia. I've always been interested in animals, particularly sea creatures. I actually worked as a vet's assistant after graduating, but was employed as a biology lecturer by the time I went to Indonesia. The university I worked for was great in letting me take a break from work to go there. Before leaving home, I decided to do a full-time diving course. Although the charity I was volunteering with said they'd provide dive training in the first two weeks of me being there, I really wanted to learn before I went. My local dive club had courses that lasted either one week or three weeks, and I chose the longer of the two to get as much experience as I could. When I arrived at the project's headquarters in the Gili Islands, it looked very much like the photos I'd seen online. What a picture could never show, though, was how good the food tasted. I was expecting it to be of the same basic quality as the accommodation there, but it was actually as good as in an expensive restaurant. Before we started diving, we were given information about why we need projects like the one I was on. Sharks have been part of marine ecosystems around the world for over 400 million years. Although it's estimated that there are over 900 million sharks left on Earth, we are losing roughly 100 million of these every year due to fishing. Many of the world's 440 species are caught accidentally, but the result is the same. So, after learning about the damage humans are doing to these beautiful creatures, I went on my first dive. Within a few minutes, a shark appeared out of the blue. It seemed to be the exact same shape as a bull shark to me, but my dive buddy told me afterwards it was actually a tiger shark. Neither of these species is as large as a white shark that most of you have probably seen in nature documentaries on TV, 
but they can grow pretty big too. Each person had a specific job to do during dives, so as soon as a shark appeared, one volunteer had to photograph it, while another, in this case me, would measure it. I used a special laser device to do this. A third person would film it, but this was quite a specialized role, which I'd like to train to do one day. Back on land, there was also plenty to do. If someone had good practical skills, which I'd never claimed to have, they were often involved with improving or fixing the charity's boats. I used my IT knowledge instead to update their advertising, which really needed doing. There was time to relax at the end of each day, too. The dances, which I usually avoided, were especially popular, and the quizzes, too, although they got a little too competitive for my liking. The presentations were what I most looked forward to. They were organized by the charity and given by researchers. I hope you found that interesting. Any questions? That is the end of the talk. In a moment, you will hear exercise three. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 3. You will hear six people talking about free time activities they enjoy. For each of speakers 1 to 6, choose from the list, A to G, which opinion each speaker expresses. Write the letter in the appropriate box. Use each letter only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You will hear the recordings twice. Speaker 1 I started making my own clothes three years ago after watching my mum and aunt doing it. Learning to use a sewing machine wasn't half as complicated as I thought it would be. The instructions were really easy to read. It's meant I can make professional looking items without having to spend ages learning how to sew by hand. I made something every weekend to begin with, but feel like I need a new challenge now. Perhaps it's time for me to have a go at another craft. I like to keep busy. Speaker 2 I love producing short videos, which I then put online. I write and film little stories and ask friends to appear in them. They're generally happy to help if they've got time. Filming in public means lots of people come up and ask what we're doing. I used to be shy when explaining to them, but that's no longer an issue for me. I even thought about becoming a professional director. But what I've read about the difficulties they have with actors means I prefer to keep filmmaking as a hobby. Speaker 3 I got into cookery after seeing reality TV shows about it. I've entered quite a few competitions now, and though it's done little to alter my ambition of becoming a doctor, I've had lots of fun. It's also given me loads of opportunities to meet new people, which I've always loved doing. Through them, I get to hear about other cookery-related events, so what was once a monthly happening has gradually evolved into a weekly occurrence. I enjoy it so much that I can't imagine taking up any other hobby. Speaker 4 When I started playing the guitar, I read that you needed to do 10,000 hours of practice if you wanted to become a professional musician. Even back then, I knew I wasn't the kind of person who'd be able to manage that. 
Two friends of mine have played the guitar for ages. Maybe one day we'll be able to play together, though probably not as frequently as we'd like because we get more schoolwork these days. I can read music pretty well and enjoy playing some quite complicated pieces. Speaker 5 In my free time, there's nothing I enjoy more than writing poetry. When I started reading poetry, I became fascinated by how you could say so much in so few words, and started trying to do it myself. I've never lacked confidence, and found that the more I practiced, the better I got. It didn't take long to come up with things I was really pleased with. I've started a poetry club with a couple of classmates, who wrote some poems themselves after reading what I'd written. Speaker 6 I spend most of my free time gaming online. I prefer to become very good at lots of different games rather than being a total expert at one or two. My plan is to eventually make a living by posting videos online of me playing various games. People who do this can get millions of views and subscribers. I read lots of reviews of new games to decide which ones to play. Then it's really exciting trying out the game to see if it's as good as the review says. Now you will hear the six speakers again. Speaker 1 I started making my own clothes three years ago after watching my mum and aunt doing it. Learning to use a sewing machine wasn't half as complicated as I thought it would be. The instructions were really easy to read. It's meant I can make professional looking items without having to spend ages learning how to sew by hand. I made something every weekend to begin with but feel like I need a new challenge now. Perhaps it's time for me to have a go at another craft. I like to keep busy. Speaker 2 I love producing short videos, which I then put online. I write and film little stories and ask friends to appear in them. They're generally happy to help if they've got time. Filming in public means lots of people come up and ask what we're doing. I used to be shy when explaining to them, but that's no longer an issue for me. I even thought about becoming a professional director. But what I've read about the difficulties they have with actors means I prefer to keep filmmaking as a hobby. Speaker 3 I got into cookery after seeing reality TV shows about it. I've entered quite a few competitions now, and though it's done little to alter my ambition of becoming a doctor, I've had lots of fun. It's also given me loads of opportunities to meet new people, which I've always loved doing. Through them, I get to hear about other cookery-related events, so what was once a monthly happening has gradually evolved into a weekly occurrence. I enjoy it so much that I can't imagine taking up any other hobby. Speaker 4 When I started playing the guitar, I read that you needed to do 10,000 hours of practice if you wanted to become a professional musician. Even back then, I knew I wasn't the kind of person who'd be able to manage that. Two friends of mine have played the guitar for ages. Maybe one day we'll be able to play together, though probably not as frequently as we'd like because we get more schoolwork these days. I can read music pretty well and enjoy playing some quite complicated pieces. Speaker 5 in my free time, there's nothing I enjoy more than writing poetry. When I started reading poetry, I became fascinated by how you could say so much in so few words and started trying to do it myself. 
I've never lacked confidence and found that the more I practiced, the better I got. It didn't take long to come up with things I was really pleased with. I've started a poetry club with a couple of classmates who wrote some poems themselves after reading what I'd written. Speaker 6 I spend most of my free time gaming online. I prefer to become very good at lots of different games rather than being a total expert at one or two. My plan is to eventually make a living by posting videos online of me playing various games. People who do this can get millions of views and subscribers. I read lots of reviews of new games to decide which ones to play. Then it's really exciting trying out the game to see if it's as good as the review says. That is the end of exercise 3. In a moment, you will hear exercise 4. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 4. You will hear an interview with a builder called Peter Holroyd, who works at a research station in Antarctica. Listen to the interview and look at the questions. For each question, choose the correct answer, A, B or C, and put a tick in the appropriate box. You will hear the interview twice. Today, Peter Holroyd's on the show talking to us from Antarctica, where he works as a builder on a research station. How did you get into the building trade, Peter? I was a fairly typical 18-year-old. I didn't push myself hard enough at school and ended up choosing the college course that was easiest to get onto. I had no real interest in the subject and left soon after I'd started. Then my uncle, who'd worked in the building trade for years, told me how much I could earn as a builder. A mate of mine was doing well at a local builder's, so I applied at the same place as him and got a job. So what attracted you to working in Antarctica? Was it an interest in the environment? Yes. The research there focuses on the environment, which I'd become really passionate about. One day, I was doing some building work at the office of an environmental organisation and asked someone there what her organisation did with the money that people donated. What she said was fascinating. So I started watching programmes about the environment and even took part in a protest about reducing how much coal and oil we use. How did you hear about your current job? I never even knew there were building jobs available in Antarctica as the trade magazine I used for finding work was generally for UK-based positions. Then a colleague told me about a blog he'd read by a woman who was working on a research station in the Antarctic. He mentioned a position there he thought I might be interested in. I contacted the research station and applied soon after. Why do you think they chose you? I doubt there was anyone on the planet who had all the skills needed for the job, but the employers knew that and offered extensive training to the successful applicant. I came away from the interview thinking I'd made a mess of it, as I didn't think I'd said enough about my experience. Anyway, I tried to show them the kind of person I am and got on well with everyone on the panel, which is probably what got me the job in the end. So what was it like leaving the UK to go to Antarctica? Leaving my friends wasn't easy, but I'm sure it would have been much worse if I'd had a wife and kids to say goodbye to as well. Before I left, I'd had to do several weeks training, which was hard because I just wanted to be there. When the plane took off, rather than the excitement I was expecting, I was just thinking, at last. Is it difficult to live in such a cold place? It was certainly a shock to begin with. 
But during the day, it's fine, as you have loads of layers to keep you warm. But it'd be impossible to wear them all in bed at night. I discovered that getting under the covers after running up and down the corridor helped the most. Hot food before bedtime was also an option, but you have to go outside into the cold to reach the restaurant. What's day-to-day -day life like for you there? There are only around 4,000 people living in Antarctica in summer, and it's such a huge continent that it's strange that I'm rarely alone. Lots of the everyday maintenance work we do is pretty repetitive, so having someone to chat to is essential. Everyone tends to have long shifts and minimal time for themselves, but there's not much to do in the way of entertainment anyway. Finally, how do you feel about living in Antarctica? There's nowhere else on Earth like it. I think that feeling of being somewhere so different comes second only to the enjoyment I get from the lack of noise here. Where I'm based is far from the noisy penguins you see on TV. It's great to see an occasional whale out at sea too. Thanks, Peter. Now you will hear the interview again. Today, Peter Holroyd's on the show talking to us from Antarctica, where he works as a builder on a research station. How did you get into the building trade, Peter? I was a fairly typical 18-year-old. I didn't push myself hard enough at school and ended up choosing the college course that was easiest to get onto. I had no real interest in the subject and left soon after I'd started. Then my uncle, who'd worked in the building trade for years, told me how much I could earn as a builder. A mate of mine was doing well at a local builder's, so I applied at the same place as him and got a job. So what attracted you to working in Antarctica? Was it an interest in the environment? Yes. The research there focuses on the environment, which I'd become really passionate about. One day, I was doing some building work at the office of an environmental organisation and asked someone there what her organisation did with the money that people donated. What she said was fascinating, so I started watching programmes about the environment and even took part in a protest about reducing how much coal and oil we use. How did you hear about your current job? I never even knew there were building jobs available in Antarctica, as the trade magazine I used for finding work was generally for UK-based positions. Then a colleague told me about a blog he'd read by a woman who was working on a research station in the Antarctic. He mentioned a position there he thought I might be interested in. I contacted the research station and applied soon after. Why do you think they chose you? I doubt there was anyone on the planet who had all the skills needed for the job, but the employers knew that and offered extensive training to the successful applicant. I came away from the interview thinking I'd made a mess of it, as I didn't think I'd said enough about my experience. Anyway, I tried to show them the kind of person I am and got on well with everyone on the panel, which is probably what got me the job in the end. So what was it like leaving the UK to go to Antarctica? Leaving my friends wasn't easy, but I'm sure it would have been much worse if I'd had a wife and kids to say goodbye to as well. Before I left, I'd had to do several weeks training, which was hard because I just wanted to be there. When the plane took off, rather than the excitement I was expecting, I was just thinking, at last. Is it difficult to live in such a cold place? It was certainly a shock to begin with. During the day, it's fine, as you have loads of layers to keep you warm but it'd be impossible to wear them all in bed at night. I discovered that getting under the covers after running up and down the corridor helped the most. Hot food before bedtime was also an option, but you have to go outside into the cold to reach the restaurant. What's day-to-day -day life like for you there? There are only around 4,000 people living in Antarctica in summer, and it's such a huge continent that it's strange that I'm rarely alone. Lots of the everyday maintenance work we do is pretty repetitive, so having someone to chat to is essential. Everyone tends to have long shifts and minimal time for themselves, but there's not much to do in the way of entertainment anyway. Finally, how do you feel about living in Antarctica? There's nowhere else on Earth like it. I think that feeling of being somewhere so different comes second only to the enjoyment I get from the lack of noise here. 
Where I'm based is far from the noisy penguins you see on TV. It's great to see an occasional whale out at sea, too. Thanks, Peter. That is the end of the interview. In a moment, you will hear exercise 5. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 5, Part A. You will hear a woman giving a talk about a famous scientist and astronomer called Johannes Kepler. Listen to the talk and complete the notes in Part A. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Hello everyone and welcome to my talk about one of the most famous astronomers and scientists ever. Johannes Kepler. Kepler was born in Germany in 1571 into a relatively poor family. As a child, he developed polio, a serious disease that affected thousands of children at this time. It made movement very difficult, so walking in many cases became impossible. Kepler was fortunate to avoid these serious effects of polio but it did weaken his eyesight, which had an impact on him for the remainder of his life. Kepler's intelligence was obvious to both his family and teachers from an early age, particularly his skills in mathematics. He was offered a scholarship at a prestigious German university and delighted in showing these abilities off to anyone who was interested, especially students who were doing the same philosophy degree as him. After leaving university, Kepler ended up teaching mathematics and also developed a passion for astronomy, the study of space, stars and planets. Another of Kepler's interests was explaining how different inventions work, the way in which a clock functions had already been documented, but even the most advanced astronomers of the age had little understanding of how a telescope allowed them to see faraway objects so clearly until Kepler explained this. It's his expertise in astronomy that Kepler is most remembered for today. He made many important discoveries during his lifetime, not least of which was his theory that the moon was responsible for creating tides, which had puzzled people for many hundreds of years. His ideas repeatedly created arguments within the scientific community because they were so different to the majority of existing theories. Kepler published many books and papers in his lifetime, and his most famous work was about how the planets move around the sun. Kepler used the word orbit to describe the movement of one object around another in space. He also came up with the word satellite for the smaller planet or moon that moved around the larger one. Although we tend to think of this word as being relatively new because of the technology it describes, it's actually over 400 years old. Since his death in 1630, Kepler's work has continued to influence scientists to the present day. I hope you enjoyed listening to my talk about this amazing scientist. Now, uh, does anyone have any questions? Now you will hear the talk again. Hello everyone and welcome to my talk about one of the most famous astronomers and scientists ever, Johannes Kepler. 
Kepler was born in Germany in 1571 into a relatively poor family. As a child, he developed polio, a serious disease that affected thousands of children at this time. It made movement very difficult, so walking in many cases became impossible. Kepler was fortunate to avoid these serious effects of polio, but it did weaken his eyesight, which had an impact on him for the remainder of his life. Kepler's intelligence was obvious to both his family and teachers from an early age, particularly his skills in mathematics. He was offered a scholarship at a prestigious German university and delighted in showing these abilities off to anyone who was interested, especially students who were doing the same philosophy degree as him. After leaving university, Kepler ended up teaching mathematics and also developed a passion for astronomy the study of space, stars and planets. Another of Kepler's interests was explaining how different inventions work, the way in which a clock functions had already been documented, but even the most advanced astronomers of the age had little understanding of how a telescope allowed them to see faraway objects so clearly until Kepler explained this. It's his expertise in astronomy that Kepler is most remembered for today. He made many important discoveries during his lifetime, not least of which was his theory that the moon was responsible for creating tides, which had puzzled people for many hundreds of years. His ideas repeatedly created arguments within the scientific community because they were so different to the majority of existing theories. Kepler published many books and papers in his lifetime, and his most famous work was about how the planets move around the sun. Kepler used the word orbit to describe the movement of one object around another in space. He also came up with the word satellite for the smaller planet or moon that moved around the larger one. Although we tend to think of this word as being relatively new because of the technology it describes, it's actually over 400 years old. Since his death in 1630, Kepler's work has continued to influence scientists to the present day. I hope you enjoyed listening to my talk about this amazing scientist. Now, uh, does anyone have any questions? Part B. Now listen to a conversation between two students, Carolina and Duncan, about space exploration, and complete the sentences in Part B. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the conversation twice. Hi, Carolina. Oh, hi, Duncan. That talk about Johannes Kepler was fantastic. It shows that space exploration has been going on for a long time, in one way or another. Yes, although it's only recently that we've actually been able to send people and objects into space to help us explore. But doing that is so expensive. It's not as though I'm totally against the idea of space exploration, but I can't help thinking that some of the huge space budget should go on other things. Such as? Well, spending on education has risen quite a bit, but housing needs sorting out. There's a massive shortage of it. Perhaps. I guess there are lots of financial issues that need thinking about, and environmental ones too, but space exploration does open up the possibility of moving to other planets. That could well go a long way to dealing with the overpopulation we're starting to see around the world. Something needs to be done about it, because it's becoming an increasingly serious issue. True. I'm not sure if people realise how much space exploration can offer, as a large number seem to be against it. I'm sure governments do all they can to attract private investment in space exploration, but very little seems to be happening in terms of getting the public support that's also essential. I've heard lots of talk about more and more people going to work and study in space. Me too. And that of course means building places for that to happen. I think there are already more than enough factories on Earth to make constructing more in space a good idea. And how much more stuff do we actually need, anyway? We're producing too much as it is. 
Building research stations there, though, would be just as useful as having them in remote places on Earth. I agree. But I really wouldn't fancy working on Mars or the Moon myself. Lots of different businesses are showing a great interest in making money out of space exploration, though. I know. I reckon it'll end up being far too costly for mining companies to make money from expanding into space. Me too. But tourism is likely to profit more than anything else if and when reasonably priced trips start taking customers up into zero gravity. I'll be first on the spaceship if that ever happens. OK, and I'll be second. Now you will hear the conversation again. Hi, Carolina. Oh, hi, Duncan. That talk about Johannes Kepler was fantastic. It shows that space exploration has been going on for a long time, in one way or another. Yes, although it's only recently that we've actually been able to send people and objects into space to help us explore. But doing that is so expensive. It's not as though I'm totally against the idea of space exploration. But I can't help thinking that some of the huge space budget should go on other things. Such as? Well, spending on education's risen quite a bit. But housing needs sorting out. There's a massive shortage of it. Perhaps. I guess there are lots of financial issues that need thinking about, and environmental ones too. But space exploration does open up the possibility of moving to other planets. That could well go a long way to dealing with the overpopulation we're starting to see around the world. Something needs to be done about it, because it's becoming an increasingly serious issue. True. I'm not sure if people realise how much space exploration can offer, as a large number seem to be against it. I'm sure governments do all they can to attract private investment in space exploration. But very little seems to be happening in terms of getting the public support that's also essential. I've heard lots of talk about more and more people going to work and study in space. Me too. And that, of course, means building places for that to happen. I think there are already more than enough factories on Earth to make constructing more in space a good idea. And how much more stuff do we actually need, anyway? We're producing too much as it is. Building research stations there, though, would be just as useful as having them in remote places on Earth. I agree. But I really wouldn't fancy working on Mars or the Moon myself. Lots of different businesses are showing a great interest in making money out of space exploration, though. I know. I reckon it'll end up being far too costly for mining companies to make money from expanding into space. Me too. But tourism is likely to profit more than anything else if and when reasonably priced trips start taking customers up into zero gravity. I'll be first on the spaceship if that ever happens. OK, and I'll be second. That is the end of question 8, and of the exam. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers.